from San Francisco, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering Console Connect Live 2015, sponsored by Console. Here's your host, John Furrier. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in San Francisco. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal noise. We are here at the Apple event, I mean, oops, Council Connect oh. event, <laughs> with the founder, Powers one the of the co-founders, Bill Norton, um, of IA, formerly IIX, now Council Inc. Uh, welcome to theCUBE, I'm here with Jeff Frick. Great to see you again, just kidding. Apple event's going on, but that's big news. Apple event is a consumer event. Yep. This is the engine room of innovation. Yeah, there's some event going on down the street. I wasn't really uh, sure what that was all about. <laughs> a small fruit company, I guess. What's going on with Council Connect? Tell, <laughs> share with the folks what it's, what it's about. I mean, you yeah. know, we know each other. We've been following your career. Founder of Equinix, uh, been an entrepreneur. You're a total networking geek. Done a pod, bunch of podcasts. Yeah. A lot of transformation, a replatforming of the internet. That's going right. On. That's right. Well, fundamentally, the, the problem on the internet today is that. There are issues that are disrupting the quality of service from many two points across the internet. Now maybe the internet works fine for you for 99.99% of the time, but that still leaves about eight hours of downtime that could impact you during a critical update or a critical service time. It could be uh, you know, during the time when your customers are calling your customer support center, and if they don't have direct access to their uh, cloud services, they're kind of in trouble. They're people are twiddling their thumbs. So fundamentally, the problem is that the value of the data for many of these enterprises is far greater than the cost of getting those bits onto the wire. So, so if Moore's Law, if you will, all this talk about smaller, faster, cheaper, is applying to transit cost packets. Right. But everyone knows that you can spoof a packet. Right. We saw a lot of examples, uh, certainly with China. Oh yeah. Stuff going run through China. People are like, wait a minute, yeah. wait, why is stuff going through a router in China? Easily hacked. Right. DDoS attacks, these are daily occurrences today. That's right. Why now the changeover, what is changing that? What's fundamentally the new opportunity to get rid of that baggage? Yeah, the, the entire day today, you're going to hear people from major companies like Amazon and Microsoft and Dropbox and LinkedIn and all these guys will be talking about some of the challenges that they've seen trying to operate the business over the commodity internet. For many of these companies, they want the best possible end user experience for their cloud service. And the way to do that is to be directly connected, to bypass the shenanigans that are happening across the public internet. And if they're directly connected, then they are in effect immune from the side effects of all that stuff going on. I love talking with you because you've been there from the beginning. You know, you talk about YouTube, Netflix, yeah. Yahoo, Google. A lot of these companies built from the ground up their own stuff. Right. And that's well known, DevOps, what do you want to call it? Sure. Um, but now we're seeing a whole other generation of things going on. You're seeing opportunities, right? right? So I was talking with Lou Tucker at Cisco, who has been around for, you know, actually has a computer in the Computer History Museum, now at Cisco, formerly his son. And we're talking about multiple clouds as the new model. Right. So inter-clouding is the term we kind of kicked around, which is like inter-networking. So that's kind of fundamentally what we see happening. Can you explain that phenomenon? Because now that the grown-ups are like the YouTubes of the world, the web scalers, the networking needs to be re refreshed, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So what does this inter-clouding transport and connections mean? Mean for business, mean for performance, quality? Sure. There, there's a, a, a fundamental problem going on right now as we speak. You've got the adoption of cloud services, where folks used to do all this stuff in-house. The adoption of cloud services uh, means that the enterprise is increasingly dependent on access to those cloud services. At the same time, you have the other force coming into play, which is the denial of service attacks. These are 100 gigabit per second attacks, nonstop flowing at a target that they want to take offline. And unfortunately, all of our traffic is intermingled at the router level along the path. So if your traffic happens to traverse the same path as the attack traffic, you're going to be subject to latency, maybe packet loss, at least jitter, the variance of latency between packets. Um, and that presents a fundamental problem for folks. Um, again, it may, not, it may not happen all the time, it may just happen a part of the time, small percentage of the time, but for companies that count on that traffic actually being delivered, 
that really matters. So what we're seeing happening and what we're talking about here today is about how the internet is fine for best effort commodity traffic, but there is a, a time when you want to amend that to also include direct connections to those mission critical destinations. Yeah. But what's different now, Bill? Because people have always had the ability to do a direct connection, right? They can get together, right. let's do a direct connection, it's in our best interest. Yeah. What's different now? The problem with doing direct connect yourself is that there's a lot of complexity, a lot of manual work. And as you all know, the first time you do something, you make a mistake or two. The second time, you maybe make different mistakes. The third time, you're getting better at it and maybe you make fewer mistakes, but you find some new ways of doing things. Um, everyone goes through that learning curve, and unfortunately, during that learning curve, you're wasting an awful lot of time, a lot of energy. Um, you almost need to have a network engineering team just to do one of those direct connects. So the alternative to that has been to hire a, a company to uh, provide consulting services to get that set up for you, and that those professional services might be very expensive. What we've done with Console is we've collected an ecosystem of partners who all want to have this direct connect ecosystem in place so they can get the best performance for their customers, right? So we've collected them together and we've made it as easy as a click of a button. So if you want to connect to Dropbox, click. You want to connect to Box, click. Everything is done using clicks. There's no need for professional services. It's fast, it's secure, So the alternative to that is to buy your own, build your own. Right hire some high-end services firm. Or if you have a networking team, if you're a big enough company to do it yourself, Google and Yahoo, these guys can, they have plenty of network yeah. engineering expertise to do this stuff themselves. Well, we've had this conversation last year, I think at the last year's event of like build your own uh, carrier model, kind of people are rolling their own. What are yeah. some of the trade-offs there and what are some of the risks that people may or may not know about, because you know, most networking guys, as you know, oh, screw, I'm, not, I'm going to build my own. They, yeah. like, they like to build stuff, they're engineers. Oh, sure. So what are the opportunities, but what are the risks as well? Yeah, I guess the, the, the biggest risk is that um, when you want to contact a, a large cloud company and say you want to direct connect, um, they're kind of sizing you up. How long is this going to take me to get that direct connect set up with John Furrier? Does he know his stuff or is he going to waste a lot of my time? Do I need to hold his hand? and they may not even return the phone call. Yeah. But if they did return the phone call and they, they did start talking with you about getting that set up, you then have to order the, the transport circuit between the, the two points. You need to configure your router, you need to configure your router on your side. We might get on the phone to see, okay, are you yeah. seeing packets, are you seeing light, those kinds of conversations. It's a very long process. And if you don't have the network well, it's expertise. it's not trivial because you need end-to-end -end expertise. So they yeah. have to assume that the other guy on the other side knows his stuff and has staff to manage it. And any inkling that this is going to be a pain, they're going to put you in, yeah. on the side and hope that maybe one of the junior guys will yeah. take that activity, because I want to just deal with the big guys getting those direct connects. But like I said, with us, if you use console, a click of a button is instantaneous and everything's automatically configured. All the fat fingered configuration errors that have happened that led to things like traffic going to Pakistan instead of to the, the destination. Right. That's all eliminated by the automated configuration. So you guys have a ton of announcements here. Um, Netelligent, Online Tech, Rack 59, Scale Matrix, T5, Azure, Hurricane Electric, Metro Optics, Summit IG, Velo Cloud, on and on and on. Yeah. All partnering up with you. Is that part of the ecosystem design? Uh, I think they found the Masonic mouse. That's the cowbell. <laughs> That's the thing. It's an innovation here. It's really a nuanced event, as I said. They use the cow blood rather than the bell. But the, um, the partnerships. Yes. This is an ecosystem. Is that yeah. part of your strategy? Was that the industry coming together? What is that about? Because that's really everyone's kind of all in saying, hey, we have now fully blown out network yeah. to do this. It's, it's been kind of a hybrid. Um, some of this has grown organically. The data centers want to have console in their building. So anyone that sees that aqua marine rack in that building knows they can get a, a cross connect over to that and get access directly to any cloud provider that they want to get access to. Um, so those are the guys who are actively promoting and, and using us as a lure to get people into that data center. Um, some of the, the, the partners are just you know, some of the biggest cloud providers in the world and those are also a gravitational pull to connect to, to, the, to the console device. What, you're in charge of research, what does that mean? What are you researching? Prices on the transit costs? Yeah. Are you looking at 
uh, research in terms of customer deployments, architecturals, reference architectures. Yeah. Can you share some of the things you're working on? Absolutely. Um, you know what I love doing, John? I love talking to people and finding out why things happen a certain way. What are the motivations? Uh, what are the motivations for Direct Connect? So I, uh, I worked on a research paper called The Business Case for Direct Connect. I haven't released it yet, but part of the process is to talk people through what the previous people have said about their motivations to direct connect. You know, uh, what's the, what are the pros and cons for connecting over the internet? What are the pros and cons for connecting directly? And what's the math? What do the finances look like? Because people will ultimately do that which is rational. So I want to get into the, 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 the head. I want to understand the mindset of the cloud companies, of the enterprises, of the, the content providers, of the access networks, and really understand how these pieces fit together. Um, and what I've learned is actually, you can connect directly and have it cost even less than accessing those cloud services over the internet. Which is really kind of a shocking thing. For the same cost or less, you get better performance, better security, better reliability, better control and better visibility because you're directly connected to the destination. And this seems to resonate with the folks I've been speaking with. So I got to ask you as a doctor, uh, <laughs> Dr. Peering is <laughs> yeah. your famous book. He started a blog called drpeering.net, Dr. Yeah. Peering. And were you, was peer review at the time you started that? I remember when you, we were chatting with you about that. <coughs> I think on the sidewalks, walking into uh, elementary school with our kids. It was a time where there's a lot of, not a lot of information around some of the peering dynamics. That's right. And I, that was the beginning, the genesis of where this all is now, right? In a way. So talk about what you've learned uh, in your yeah. journey of Dr. Peering, talking to folks, and then there's a book now on Amazon. Sure. And how does that relate vis-a-vis -vis what's happening with console? Yeah, um, so in um, 2008, I retired from Equinix and um, cashed out all my stock options and spent time trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And one of the things I did while I was at Equinix, I, I wrote all these white papers. Again, the process is, I want to learn something, why not talk to some experts? So I'll, I'll say, John, I'm interested in talking about peering. Uh, how does peering work in your organization? And over beers and drinks at uh, yeah, We high-five each other all the time. Yeah, a lot of handshakes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I would document what I learned in the field in the form of a white paper. And I would make that freely available to anyone who wanted the white paper. And um, that got me invited to speak at conferences, so I'd do a, a gig and share what I learned, and then I'd use that as a launching point for my next white paper. Uh, in 2008, when I retired from Equinix, I decided to rewrite all those white papers into a cohesive and coherent form, and uh, put it out. Now, internet interconnection is a fairly narrow niche topic, but for those who are interested in how interconnection works on the internet, what's the nature of the business relationships at the core, um, this book is really interesting to them. Yeah. And I've gotten a lot of engagements uh, working with various people. I mean, it's not a big market segment, it's in the long tail, if you will. Yeah. But it's a lot of the big players need interconnect. Like I mentioned, Google, oh, yeah. Yahoo, YouTube, you name it, they're all powering massive traffic. Absolutely. And are a big part of that. And care about things yeah. like bad guys intermingled in the packet stream. Oh, yeah. And there are all kinds of games that get played on the internet. And uh, you know, for, for those of us who are in this sector, um, our neurons in our brain kind of fire as these clever tricks and manipulations come forward. <laughs> so the book has tons of stories of, of these, these creative tactics for manipulating things so you get peering where you otherwise would not be able to get peering. Anyway, the book is about yay thick. It's a heavy yeah. book. <clears throat> and um, it really describes peering 1.0. This is the manual way of getting connected up. What we're doing here is what we call interconnection 2.0, where everything is automated. You don't need to go to all these events to meet people, to exchange cards and schedule calls to review peering policies and that kind of stuff. We've automated everything. We've made it simple and easy to, with a click of a button, get access to destinations. So I was going to say, so, so it sounds like there's really three cores. There's one is the automation, right? Which yeah. is always good to make things automated, yep. less errors. Two is um, really the ecosystem yeah. that's really coming together and we see ecosystems as such a powerful force. Oh, yeah. Whether we were at VMworld last week or at OpenStack the week before, right? Ecosystems are hugely powerful. And then the third really sounds like being able to push, because of the automation, and, and, and the ease, being able to push that capability down into a marketplace that maybe just didn't have the opportunity to participate. You got it, that's absolutely what we're doing. The, um, the, there are smaller content providers 
and there are medium to smaller enterprises that really haven't looked at direct connection. And they won't until they have enough problems across the commodity internet that they say, you know what, we, we count on this service. I don't care about the rest of this stuff, but we really need to have access to the payment processing uh, system. Whatever system that is, we need to be directly connected to that. That's how they're going to prioritize how and, and where they're going to interconnect their networks with other uh, folks. Um, and before that, the commodity internet is going to be good enough. Um, but there's going to be a, a trigger point. I think the, uh, one of the researchers will be saying, he estimates that by 2018, this is going to be the common way for people to use the internet. Use the internet, commodity internet for most stuff, but then directly connect to whatever mission critical destinations they need to be directly connected to. So we have, uh, this is the start of it. I think in a couple of years we'll be back here, we'll be talking about the, uh, the I don't know, the 20,000th connection to the You know, system. we pride ourselves at Silicon Angle on the Cube going in new areas that people are like, what, why are they kind of off, off the beaten path? And I think you guys are onto something really huge. I think there's going to be a re-platforming of Interconnect that's going to change yeah. and create an opportunity for other entrepreneurs in a whole level, another level of quality of service. I mean, it's clear in my mind the vision. I think you guys have a great vision. But I want to ask you one, the final question here, to tie it back to DevOps, because the yeah. big range right now at VMworld is cloud native applications. Yep. And so let's just kind of go there. Huge tsunami of people building new applications. So as they look down, they want programmable infrastructure. Absolutely. They want infrastructure as code. Yeah. And so you guys are really part of that equation. So being in the engine room at the lowest level, the network level, what does infrastructure as code mean to you and how do you serve all those millions of new developers that are going to be hitting the market? Yeah, that's one of the, um, the, the key buzzwords you hear in the industry is software-defined networking. We've coined the term software-defined interconnect because our platform has an API that will allow companies to integrate the system into their own systems. So data centers, for example, might want to have our system be part of their provisioning system. So on their portal, they can say, you know, we'd like to be able to provision connectivity from one point to the next for one of our customers. And for them to be able to do that via an API is immensely powerful, as opposed to the traditional path of calling a salesperson, saying I want to circuit from point A to point B, and they schedule a delivery, and then they turn up and test, so all of that kind of stuff is uh, enormously time intensive. And that enables the DevOps piece. That's right, the, the software to find interconnect and the APIs to do that, yeah. uh, uh, we believe will be incredibly powerful. So for you're those saying end-to-end -end networks, so if, I'm, if I want SD, software to find networking, virtualization, network virtualization, whatever version of that is, they need to have an end-to-end -end secure link. That helps them. Absolutely. Um, you know, security is enormously important to the enterprise customers. Security, um, you know, when I did that, the white paper on the business case for Direct Connect, the number one reason for doing Direct Connect was security. I thought it was going to be performance, yeah. or maybe the reliability. The other two answers, they come up very commonly. But no, it was security as the number one thing. They wanted to make sure that that traffic got there and went across the yeah. simplest, most direct path. The other one that came up was control and visibility. There's a cowbell again. <laughs> uh, yeah, control and visibility. When I did the white paper walkthroughs, a number of folks said, you didn't mention control and visibility. And the, the problem the enterprise and the cloud company sees is traffic from point A to point B on average traverses four ASs, four networks. And each of those four networks has public facing nodes that could be attacked. Uh, this is what the security guys call a large attack surface. And <clears throat> part of the problem is you don't have visibility into that connectivity uh, between those intermediary networks. That means that if there's a problem there, you can't see it and you can't control it. You can't even call those guys and say, hey, there's a problem between yeah. these two points. So for those guys, uh, the, the cloud companies and the enterprise. It's a feeding ground for the bad guys. Uh, the internet, yeah. It's a, it's a wonderful attack surface if you want to hit things. Yeah. Bill Norton here, entrepreneur, um, very seasoned entrepreneur. Congratulations on your new venture and your research here. It was theCUBE live at console. Connect here in San Francisco. We'll be right back more after this short break.